evening. I'm David Reich. I am Chief of Abdominal Organ Transplant at Drexel University, Auburn University Hospital. Um, my forte is liver transplant, and um, as you've heard, I uh, perform uh, kidney and pancreas transplant as well. So it's uh, uh, my honor to come out and talk to people who have uh, donated organs and um, have loved ones who have donated and who have uh, a lot of resilience after their organ transplants. So it's good to meet you all. And my disclosures, um, <laughs> certainly um, uh, this is a voluntary. Mm -hmm. I am a huge fan of uh, TRIO and um, definitely a positively impacted by, um, by Jim. I uh, have the uh, privilege of working with Jim in a lot of UNOS endeavors. Uh, and, um, his uh, uh, his uh, energy and uh, resilience and uh, compassion and leadership and all are just uh, keep a lot of professionals moving. We see him doing all this and um, motivates us to just do more and more. So thank you, Jim. We appreciate it. So we'll talk a little bit about, uh, so if we want to organize our thoughts on a cancer and transplant, I think that uh, we would um, have to address issues of recipients who have had some uh, contact with cancer before a potential organ transplant, and we want to talk about uh, transplant uh, donors, potential donors who have had a history of cancer, and then um, I guess what it sounds like most of you are, are uh, interested in, how to avoid or if necessary, treat cancer after transplant. So I'll try to cover these topics in the slides and we can have uh, time for questions. Um, not to be too preachy, because I think a lot of you have done more living than me perhaps, but um, I just want, you know, I have a couple of these scattered throughout, just my um, impressions over the years. You're, and it's something that I tell a lot of my uh, staff. Uh, you're not a sickly or transplanted organ, you're a person, and that'll be a very important theme in this talk. You need to take care of not just your organ, uh, not just consider your uh, end-stage organ disease for candidates, but really to do that in the context of the rest of your body, your health, the rest of your life, and we'll get into that. So if we look at uh, liver transplant as an example, which is one of the more uh, was one of the more challenging uh, transplants uh, in terms of the success stories. I mean, early on, uh, you know, the, the um, I guess the fortitude of the of the pioneers back in the '60s and '70s, when so few patients survived, is remarkable. But it's uh, good that they uh, persevered because now, at a year after transplant, which you know is an important milestone, certainly not the long-term goal. We want to live for decades and not a year, but. The uh, one-year survival after a liver transplant is over 90%. So this is such a successful endeavor now. Uh, and we need to keep that in mind as we talk about you know, something difficult like cancer. We're talking about something that um, you know, affects patients, but fortunately most do well. So this is from a, a very uh, robust database of transplant recipients in uh, New Zealand. But the, uh, the slide looked good, and, and uh, the data is completely transposable over the data from the US. So the causes of, of death in a transplant population are, uh, you know, each organ is a little bit different, but by and large is not related to organ failure. So uh, organs do fail and can cause, uh, you know, that, that uh, tragedy, but um, most patients who succumb after an organ transplant succumb with a functioning graft, as you know. And the, the two uh, leading um, causes of death after a transplant are cardiovascular problems, and we'll see that decrease year after year because, as you know, most of those complications are related to side effects of immunosuppression, and the immunosuppressant options are so much better than they used to be. And then uh, cancer. So it's an important topic to talk about. How do we avoid that problem? Uh, if we look at uh, kidney transplant uh, patients, so recipients of either deceased donor or live donor kidneys, uh, 
if you go decades out after a transplant, the incidence of cancer, now this does include skin cancer, which is typically quite curable, so don't, don't get too depressed looking at this. It's to heighten your um, uh, focus on the topic, not to be discouraging, is higher than 50% in, in many populations. Uh, if we look at um, the uh, particular types of cancers that we'll, that we'll address, so the most um, uh, the most um, common are the ones on the bottom of the slide. So uh, skin cancers happen 20 times more common in all solid organ transplant recipients than in the general population, and we'll see in some groups like heart transplant recipients, it's even higher than that. Uh, PTLD is, a, is an abbreviation for post-transplant proliferative disorder, in layman's terms, lymphoma. So there's a spectrum of PTLD, but it's, uh, we'll get into it a little bit because it's the, um, one of the most common cancers after transplant and is 20 times more common than in the general population. And there's a spectrum of disease there. PTLD is related to um, there are a couple of risk factors that we'll talk about, but there's a spectrum as benign as mononucleosis to benign lymph tissue growth, uh, and then in the most severe form, lymphoma. Uh, Kaposi sarcoma is, um, you might think of it along the lines of skin cancer, it's a little bit different. So those are the most uh, severe, uh, those are the most Severe and the most common, uh, not skin cancer being severe, but, but the uh, lymphoma and, um, is the most severe and, and, and very common. Now kidney uh, cancer really is an issue for kidney recipients, okay? It's not a huge problem in the kidney recipient population, but the kidneys that are left behind, because we don't take out, typically we don't remove the um, uh, recipients uh, native kidneys when we do a kidney transplant. Those kidneys uh, are at higher risk for developing kidney cancer. Now, and a question, Dave, if I may. Please. Yeah. Why would you leave them in there if they are subject to uh, the higher risk? The, well, the old risk kidneys is, I'm talking about. That's a great question. Um, the risk is, uh, it, although the risk of kidney cancer is 15 times as high in a kidney population than in the general public, it's still a very low risk. Um, so of 100 you know, patients, very few will develop kidney cancer. Uh, and with proper screening, uh, it can be treated with a very high rate of success if the cancer occurs. Kidney cancer is typically uh, slow growing, and so we'll get into screening and all. Uh, putting a dialysis patient through a bilateral nephrectomy, removing both kidneys is quite a bit of surgery. And the risks of that are higher than the risks of leaving them in and then watching recipients to make sure that they're not uh, the minority that will develop a kidney cancer. And if they are, take out the kidney then. Okay. And you would have to take out not necessarily both kidneys, but you know, maybe just one kidney. So there are some patients that have their kidneys removed before transplant, but it's not really because of this risk of cancer. It's because of some other. Um, are you going to be talking about the symptoms later on? One of the things yeah. I'd be curious of is a kidney cancer how do you even recognize it? You're going to talk about that later, just leave it alone. I, but think, if not, that, I think that we will. Um, okay. So the, in a nutshell, um, certainly anybody who has uh, a kidney transplant and develops any kind of bloody discharge, uh, that needs to be addressed uh, very expeditiously, okay. uh, which any compliant recipient would do. Uh, but um, most patients who develop the kidney cancer uh, have it picked up with uh, surveillance. So they follow the transplant program and they get ultrasounds and they'll be told that they have some mass in the kidney before they would even have symptoms before it would get large enough to cause bleeding. And, uh, well, let, let me ask the question of those who've had kidney transplants. Do, do they follow up? Do they do yes. ultrasounds and stuff I, like that later on? Mike, I had I developed cancer on my kidney. Uh-huh. And uh, they did by ultrasounds and, uh, and testing. They, my doctor saw that the kidney was getting larger. Okay. And then uh, he told me it's time now to 
to remove it because he was concerned the size of the kidney at the time. Okay. So Susan? Yeah. Now, I've never had any uh, ultrasounds or follow up and it's 17 years. We'll get into it. It's a little bit controversial. Okay. Because I've had two years and, like Susan, mm -hmm. no testing. Yeah. So I am going to discuss screening. Some things are not controversial. Um, but some of the screening is, and we'll get into the um, the uh, pluses and minuses. Uh, essentially, with the ultrasound screening, the minuses are that sometimes little lumps show up that are not cancerous, and they lead to you know, biopsies and surgeries that are needed. And so, um, it's a little bit of a uh, there's a balancing act, and uh, some patients are more prone to kidney cancer than others. We'll get into that a little bit, and so. Okay. It's a great topic to discuss with your uh, with your transplant team, but uh, uh, it seems like it was uh, beneficial to you that you had the screening. Yes. Good health with that. Mm -hmm. And um, the fact that some others haven't is not a uh, uh, to be construed as a criticism of their caregivers or their care plan because it is a little bit more nuanced. Now, the. Um, uh, the risk of the more common cancers that people know of, colon cancer, lung, stomach cancer, pancreas, you know, um, breast and all, is about twice the general population. So that's also significant, but um, not as um, marked an increased risk as compared to the skin cancer and lymphoma. Those are the ones that we really worry about um, in the transplant population. This is uh, very complex, but essentially is a, is a way for me to remember to point out. If you look at, um, this is a heart and liver transplant population. We just spoke about kidney, so I have one up for heart and liver. Um, and this uh, also points out that the risk of all cancers is about two plus times more common than in the general population. So this isn't just an issue for kidney recipients. And um, the, uh, for all comers, uh, the risk of skin cancers is, um, can be as high as 50 times as high, and of lymphoma, 16% uh, as high. So uh, this is an issue for recipients of any solid organ. We'll get into causes a little bit. Um, so certainly we need to discuss a recipient's uh, past history because uh, the body has immune function. And so if we have, uh, if someone has a cancer, they may be cured, they may not have a recurrence. Their immune system is part of the reason that you know, whatever treatments they receive, they receive, and then the immune system uh, helps to keep the cancer at bay, because the immune system fights cancer. After a transplant, patients receive immunosuppression, and so cancers that wouldn't necessarily be a problem without the immunosuppression can be a problem if a patient gets a transplant. And that's why recipient history of cancer weighs into uh, the chances for a post-transplant cancer. Um, the other, and I'm going to get into that a little bit, but the other uh, big uh, bag of you know risk would be a donor, whether it be a deceased donor, which is the more common situation, or a live donor that had a cancer, because the cancer involved uh, an organ that isn't the same organ that's being transplanted. But that organ that's being transplanted has some of the circulating blood cells in it, in its blood, in its vasculature. And so the donor's uh, prior cancer could get transmitted through an organ. And maybe that donor wouldn't have had significant cancer uh, because they have an immune system keeping the cancer at bay. But then you take their organ, you transplant it, and then the recipient who's on immunosuppression, it could flourish into a cancer. Uh, and that's why both the recipient and the donor history are something that we always 
focus on when we decide about the risks and benefits of doing a particular transplant, of listing a patient for a transplant, of accepting an organ for a transplant. Um, and we'll talk about those things and then after transplant, regardless of the past recipient and donor histories, there, there's the risk of cancer because of immunosuppression. So this is a sort of a way of organizing the risks. Now with recipient history, um, I, mean, I think, let me see if I, uh, yeah, so what do, you, what do you do if you had a cancer and require a transplant? Um, so it depends on the type of cancer that one had um, because the, the risk really varies depending on the cancer. Uh, but um, generally speaking, we like to wait two to five years after a recipient, after a, a potential recipient's cancer is cured before we would go on to expose them to immunosuppression. Um, so that doesn't include recipients who've had skin cancers, um, most skin cancers, because those are, uh, those are very low risk for uh, causing, even if they recur, they're not uh, typically lethal. Um, cancers that are, um, I guess the layman's term would be precancerous lesions. Um, for instance, uh, uh, you may have heard of uh, carcinoma in situ. That is, uh, you know, uh, could probably some patients could be listed for a transplant immediately, and certainly you wouldn't wait five years. You might wait, you know, a year or two. There are some cancers that are uh, at very high risk for occurring in the face of immunosuppression. Melanoma is one. Um, advanced breast cancer. Um, advanced colon cancer. So these are very significant uh, cancers that, you know, in addition to whatever end-stage organ disease a patient had, um, uh, it, it would it would be obvious that a patient who had a cancer like this would have a lot of issues in terms of being considered for for an organ transplant. Uh, we don't want to. Uh, some some patients will do better without a transplant because if we immunosuppress them cancer that they had will come back much uh, faster and more aggressively. So um, I don't know if there are questions about this, but I think uh, me. candidates... I want to yeah. why you're getting a transplant is cancer. Okay, so that's a great uh, question too. So there are some uh, patients who receive the, cancer, the, the transplant to treat the cancer. The most common uh, example of that is liver cancer. Okay, so uh, this comment isn't to uh, isn't meant to address a transplant of an organ where the organ is being removed because of cancer. It's to address um, a recipient whose cancer doesn't involve the organ that is end stage, but is going to be sharing the same home as the new organ. And uh, we'll talk about liver cancer. I have some slides on that if we have time at the end. That is really the main one. I don't. Uh, no of uh, other, I mean, sometimes patients will have their kidneys removed for cancer and then, you know, end up needing a transplant later. That's unusual. So the real, um, I mean, with heart, lung, liver, I mean, the real uh, pancreas, we don't transplant for cancer. So it's really liver cancer that we're talking about when we talk about the transplant to treat the cancer. And I'll, I'll, I'll have some more on it. But uh, I think that's all I've got on the recipient cancer history is being important. And the general idea is if you have you know, friends or colleagues or relatives who had some cancer, it doesn't mean they can't get a transplant. Uh, so many recipients do have a past cancer history, but it, it's something important to address early on. Um, and then, should you accept an organ from a donor who had cancer? Of course, uh, for you know, a group of people who are focused on transplant and want to uh, receive transplants and, and have safety and all of that, why would anybody want to take an organ from someone who had cancer? Well, um, there are many very uh, life-saving, uh, life, uh, great organs from 
donors who have had some issue with cancer. In today's healthcare environment, cancers are diagnosed very early, and uh, the donor, the deceased donor population is aging, and so it's not unusual to um, have uh, a donor with a cancer history. Precancerous lesions like skin cancers don't get transmitted with organ transplant. Uh, donors who have had cancer more than five years ago, in most cases, that doesn't get transmitted through the organ transplant. Uh, and some early stage cancers, kidney, colon, even lung, breast, um, can be uh, transplanted. Um, donors who have had melanoma, sarcoma, are more advanced, lung, colon, uh, so on. Even if that was many years ago, those organs are not usually used unless um, you know, it's for something that is, you know, where a recipient needs the organ within a couple of days or they'll, or they'll succumb. Not so relevant to kidney, but for something like liver transplant. Every time we get a donor offer, uh, we, um, you know, we assess this very carefully. We try to go back and get the donor's medical history if it's a deceased donor, talk to family members, get pathology results, sometimes gift of life or wherever the uh, organ procurement organization is will uh, try to work with families to delay a donor procurement if it's at night until we can get records and make a safe decision about this. Uh, there's nothing more um, more uh, uh, painful, I think, for a, a transplant surgeon to transplant an organ and then find out a few months later that the recipient that you've transplanted, uh, you've conveyed a cancer to from the donor. It's, it's really an awful situation. So fortunately, this happens very rarely. But it's uh, something that the uh, transplant teams are always assessing each and every organ donor uh, very um, uh, uh, scrupulously. And um, there's a phenomenal uh, uh, disease transmission um, committee that's part of uh, UNOS and monitors these episodes. And um, you know, when one recipient got, gets a donor derived malignancy, it's important to let the other recipients know because maybe they can be you know, treated. Uh, and so there's sharing, rapid sharing, you know, real time of information when this rare occurrence happens. And um, so I don't know if there are questions about that, but uh, uh, we talk about this with all the transplant candidates we have so that you know, if we get a call at two or three in the morning that we have an organ for them, we of course convey the donor's relevant history, but often those are really good donors to accept. And if, um, you know, the risk of turning the organ down versus taking the organ in many cases with a very low risk of conveying cancer weighs in favor of accepting it. So, uh, do you want to ask a question? No, please. So, I saw a presentation on this uh, perfusion technique that is being used for certain organs. Yes. And the one that I saw was being used on lungs. And uh, I sort of remember, but but maybe I'm incorrect, that uh, um, that the person making the presentation said that this technique could not only uh, allow the lung to last a little longer, but could also make it a little better. And and I thought that he also said it that could get rid of some of the cells inside of the lung that might be a disadvantage for the recipient. Uh, um, yeah, your um, your knowledge of, of cutting edge uh, techniques is is, is advanced. Um, and uh, that's true. So we pumped kidneys, as you know, for um, many years. And when uh, a donor has a, a virus or a cancer history where the uh, risk of, of transmission isn't a large concern, uh, it is still sometimes thought that the pumping will decrease the viral load or the cancer load because the, those cells do uh, get conveyed through the bloodstream. So you can sort of, you know, wash them out. Now some of them are stuck to the blood vessels in the organ. Uh, the um, uh, perfusion uh, of organs now is uh, spread. Uh, it's experimental, but spread to the um, lung, and now there's work with liver and with heart. And uh, there's certainly no evidence of what you're saying because it hasn't been tested, but theoretically that um, 
you know, that would be a, a, an added benefit. Uh, firstly, if you don't have adequate time to get history, it allows you to keep the organs before you make a you know, decision too quickly. And um, that uh, hours, you know, several hours worth of perfusion could, uh, could decrease the, the cancer load if it was there. So it'll be interesting to see if it, if it does that. Um, but it makes theoretical sense that it would. So maybe Rich, increase the safety of the organs that we're transplanting even more, that's right. Rich, you had a question back here? Oh, oh, <clears throat> other than getting family history and maybe viewing previous medical records, are there other things that you can do to detect cancer in potential donors? Well, it's very important for the uh, transplant surgeon who um, removes the organs to do a very careful inspection during the donor surgery uh, because we can tell a lot by examining you know, the um, various body cavities and various organs. And if we see something that we're not sure what it is, a lump, a mass, uh, we have to biopsy that and um, make sure that we're um, you know, not doing something bad. Uh, we also look at uh, x-rays before the donor procurements. Uh, if there's any you know, question of something there, then we'll make arrangements to get biopsies either before or during the procurement. So it's history and, um, if you will, physical. All right, so we've talked a little bit about the recipient's past cancer risks, and we've talked about the donor's cancer risks. Uh, but uh, every transplant recipient, regardless of the donor, regardless of uh, whether they had a past history of cancer, do have a higher risk of getting a cancer after transplant. So transplant recipients do well, most don't get cancer, but we're going to talk about uh, those that do and, and what we can avoid uh, becoming one of those. Um, so there, there are several parts of this. So some of the immunosuppressant drugs are carcinogenic. Now the risk of carcinogenic, in other words, they, they can cause cancer. Now the risk of them causing cancer is incredibly low. Uh, otherwise the FDA wouldn't approve the drugs. But, you know, they are, they do, uh, some of the drugs do have a small risk of, um, of causing cancer. But more um, relevant, the immunosuppressive drugs alter our immunity so that we don't reject the organs. And in doing that, it's true that we don't reject the organs, but we also uh, don't um, have the same defense against cancer. I'll get into it a little bit more. Also, the immunosuppressive drugs, by lowering our immunity, so we don't, you know, we don't reject, but we have a higher risk of cancer. We also have a higher risk of certain viruses which in of themselves may not be particularly important to us, but those viruses, in some instances, cause cancer. So what, what the does the, I'm sorry, what does the word onco mean in oncogenic and oncovirus? Um, thanks for asking. So onco means uh, uh, leading to cancer. So those okay. are viruses that lead to cancer. Fine, thank you. Are, are so they virus names that would be familiar to us? I'm gonna go through them, yes. Um, and. Uh, some of these slides are from more for a medical community, so if there's a word here that isn't clear, just type up and um, I tried to uh, I tried to uh, make them clear, but some things I think may have slipped through. Now, on the other hand, some of these appreciate for the cartoon aspect of it. I wouldn't expect you to know each of the individual uh, cells up there or what the what the initials are for, but the, the message here is that um, there's a balance between um, immunosuppression, and then what immunosurveillance means is, is the immune protection that we have, okay? So on the left side, you have um, all of our immune cells, B cells, and you see those on the left side of the screen. And on the uh, right side, we have uh, cancerous cells. Uh, actually, the, the cancerous cells are in the middle, and on the right side, we have uh, cells that um, promote cancer. So if you will, normally our immune function 
keeps cancer at bay. So if we even have some cells that become precancerous, we don't even develop that cancer because the cancer cells nip them in the bud. Um, there are also cells that cause inflammation and those can increase cancer growth. So in an immunosuppressed environment, when we take immunosuppressive drugs, okay, um, there's a predominance of the effect of our immune system causing cancer and we lose the protective uh, mechanisms. Um, when we get into the viruses, there's also a balance. That's what the scale is about. And so viruses have um, proteins that promote cancer. They also promote inflammation that can lead to cancer. Angiogenesis is a, is a hot topic in medicine, and what it means is uh, blood vessel growth. Because cancers are, uh, cancers are very uh, energy dependent, and they need a lot of blood vessels. So there are viruses that cause increased angiogenesis, which helps cancers grow. And then viruses inhibit some of the immune uh, functions that we have that keep cancers at bay. So not only do the immunosuppressive drugs alter our immunity and increase the chance of cancer, but the viruses that they cause, that the immunosuppressive drugs cause, directly on their own also lead to um, uh, mechanisms that will make the cancer uh, progress. Uh, we have um, things that are called, for instance, tumor suppressor genes. Uh, that's part of our immune system that keep cancers at bay. There are the viruses that we'll talk about that are uh, increased in the face of immunosuppression decrease those tumor suppressor genes, as an example. So uh, to simplify what is a couple of complicated slides, immunosuppression is great at keeping us from getting rejection, but it increases it creates a very fertile environment for cancer growth. It does that directly and it does it through certain viruses that cause cancers. Okay. Um, these are some of the uh, viruses that are involved. Now some of the cancers that we get after a transplant are not related to viruses, but from the perspective of viruses. So skin cancer is, um, uh, is um, related many times to something called uh, papillomavirus, and that's HPV. Lymphoma uh, is usually related to um, Epstein-Barr virus, and you would have heard of Epstein-Barr virus um, from mononucleosis, because mononucleosis is a, is a, um, is a viral infection from Epstein-Barr virus. Epstein-Barr virus in a non-immunosuppressed person, you know, may cause mononucleosis. Many people have Epstein-Barr virus and don't remember ever having mononucleosis. But patients who have Epstein-Barr virus and are immunosuppressed can get lymphoma. Uh, liver cancer um, is um, one of the main causes of liver cancer is hepatitis B and also hepatitis C. Excuse me. And then um, there's um, uh, another herpes virus that can cause what's called Kaposi sarcoma. So this just, um, I don't think that as a, you know, as a lay population, you necessarily need to know which virus causes which cancer, but since we're talking about cancer, uh, you may have a little bit of an inkling now about how immunosuppression <laughs> is, um, is the uh, culprit. So um, another Reichism, but I think I think I would I think this is a good point in time to reiterate that most immunosuppressive regimens are uh, safe for the overwhelming majority of transplant recipients who take them, and the risk of cancer uh, is, um, although it has increased, is still relatively small. And we haven't even talked about ways to, you know, there are ways to avoid the cancer and to treat it and all. 
So we've talked now about when it happens, what causes it, but we're gonna, we're not done yet. So I think, um, uh, you know, what, I, what I've got here is to choose a competent team you trust, because uh, some recipients are um, uh, so worried about this, and I understand, I feel, you know, you have an organ from a, from a donor and not everything is perfectly controlled and you're taking medications and it can be stressful, but, um, you know, most of the transplant teams know what they're doing, and uh, I think um, you know in most cases when a patient generally follows advice, sometimes you can have second opinions, but you pick who you trust and you follow advice, and at that point, rather than worrying as much as possible, uh, I think this is a you know a perfect situation to focus on health and well-being because that's something that one can do that really can decrease the chance of a bad outcome from cancer. So, you know, positive energy to decrease the chance of something not good happening. And we'll talk about how to do that. But health and well-being. So we're talking tonight about, you know, cancer, but we could talk about cardiovascular health. We could talk about uh, um, many other issues that are, are post-transplant issues. Remember I said that we're not an organ, we're, we're a body, we're a life. And um, these are so important, um, not only because they decrease a lot of non-cancerous problems, like cardiovascular problems after a transplant, but in most cases, these have a uh, positive impact on not getting cancer, and if one has cancer, doing better with it. So tobacco, obviously, we're already at higher risk for lung cancer, no point in smoking. Excessive alcohol, the risk of liver cancer. Uh, excessive weight. Weight is, you know, heavy, heavy weight is immunosuppressing in and of itself. Uh, stress. Well, it doesn't do good to worry so much about cancer that you have a heart attack in the process. Uh, sun. Something that obviously with skin cancer we're going to talk about a fair amount in later slides. And so healthy eating, uh, getting enough rest because that is promoting of immunosuppression, of, of immune function, excuse me. So people who are um, chronically sleep deprived have decreased immune function. We know that. Stress reduces immunity. Getting enough exercise, having work-life balance, and um, of course, uh, keeping up with uh, physician appointments, screening, exams, and so on, I think are what would promote health and well-being. And you look like a group that could probably teach me some things in this area, but um, many of the recipients you know, sometimes could use a refresher on this. All right, so um, how do we avoid getting post-transplant cancer? So it's very important to have proper screening before getting the transplant, because we know that after the transplant, whatever there might have been that's a small problem we put into an immunosuppressed environment will become a big problem. So we want to get rid of precancerous lesions uh, before a transplant. And uh, any, as you know, any transplant workup includes things like you know, colonoscopy, chest x-ray, and so on, and that's, that's the reason. If there's something there, we want to know about it before immunosuppressing our recipients. Uh, doing what you're doing, getting educated. I mean, there's nothing more empowering than knowing that you don't want to worry, but you want to know why you're doing things and, and why things uh, are the way they are so that you can improve your health. Then, for some of the cancers, there are, you know, preventive things we can do. We'll talk about, for instance, uh, sunscreen in transplant recipients to avoid skin cancer. It works, you know. Uh, Post-transplant screening, why do we want to screen? Well, you know, in some transplant recipients, they've had it. Uh, they've had enough health issues, medical care, they're done, they have the transplant, and they don't want to find other problems. But that's not scientifically sound because a lot of the cancers that we uh, can develop, if we find them early, are treatable with close to 100% cure. If we wait too long and the cancers get advanced, then we don't have options. So screening isn't looking for problems, it's, it's important health maintenance, health and well-being. And then, if a cancer is diagnosed, it doesn't mean the end. I mean, we have remarkable um, 
therapies available for so many today, even in complicated situations of immunosuppression and having uh, you know, organ recipients and all of that. Uh, it's important there, of course, to have a really good team. And we'll talk on that. Um, I guess we'll talk on that now. So in terms of the screening that one does for before the transplant and the, um, you know, the uh, regimen of um, preventive things after a transplant and when a, trans when a cancer is found, the treatment, the team approach is so incredibly important. So the transplant team, sure, you know, those are the folks that know the most about uh, cancer in a transplant population exposed to immunosuppression, but we need to work with oncologists. The further out from a transplant that a transplant patient becomes, the more involved they are with their primary care physicians. But we, we need to communicate well and, and have a very um, efficient and uh, collaborative um, relationship with, the, with your other care uh, team. And then have a, a cadre of specialists when we need them. Gastroenterologists, you know, to do endoscopic procedures, uh, gynecologists who, you know, understand the issues relevant to um, women who are on immunosuppression, a radiology team that understands the nuances of imaging in a transplant patient, uh, urologists, for instance, we talked about kidney cancer and, and you know, in uh, kidneys that don't work, <coughs> dermatologists that are um, savvy about uh, immunosuppression. Because not every dermatologist or gynecologist or whatever specialist you have up there feels comfortable treating uh, organ transplant recipients. So it's transplant centers should and, and many do have um, collaborative efforts with um, subspecialists at their institutions or outside of their institution whom they work with. So that when a problem arises, you have caregivers that are interested in this issue and want to uh, have a positive impact on it. So this is important too. If you're <clears throat> asking questions, you're at all great centers. Um, you know, some patients are you know, maybe at centers where they'll quickly get a feel for they, that's not a team that really has that set up. So um, in such a sophisticated way, and I think in you know, 2015, this is, this is critical. If you're gonna do organ transplant, you have to have a whole large team there to support a patient after. All right, well, uh, something a little light here, but um, <laughs> the, um, the idea here is that uh, you need to, um, you know, you need to get screened and see physicians and get screened. Um, and uh, I knew Bob would like that one. <laughs> I can relate. <laughs> So let's talk about screening. Um, uh, so some of the viruses that we spoke about cause um, uh, you know, cause tumors down in the, in the private area, and that's where a good physical exam comes in. So um, you know, no one likes parading around in a birthday suit, but I think you know, transplant recipients should. Take it all off and have the doctor really check them from head to toe because um, what is a small problem can be picked up early on and, and treated very successfully. Ultrasound of native kidneys. So we talked about that already. Um, particularly kidneys that have a lot of cysts in them are prone to developing cancer. Cysts are, are collections of fluid. They're not uh, solid masses, they're fluid masses and those um, some kidneys have a lot of cysts and so that's something that your transplant team will consider when they decide whether or not to recommend uh, ultrasound surveillance if they do recommend it it's usually done on an annual basis the benefits are ultrasounds don't hurt they're not invasive they're not that expensive and um, if uh, a kidney cancer is picked up early uh, it is treatable with a very high rate of success. And here we're talking about removing a kidney that's not functioning to boot. So uh, by and large, um, cystic kidneys benefit from having ultrasound, uh, but um, you know, this is something that you should ask your transplant team about. It's 
useful for some and, and less useful for others. The, um, it's certainly important for women to have their um, pap smears because cervical cancer is a higher risk in, um, and is related to viruses in the transplant recipient population, so you know, annual pap smear is important. Uh, prostate, we don't know what to do about prostate screening in non-transplant recipients. It's, it's all over the place and um, so I'm just not going to comment, certainly not on a, on a video, uh, <laughs> except to say, ask your doctor. Um, but this isn't a much different situation than in the general population. Colon cancer, so I think um, this is one that is really important to keep up with because Colon cancer starts as polyps, and polyps are removed, and if polyps are removed, you don't get colon cancer. It's simple as that. So the, the risk of colon cancer in a transplant recipient is about twice as high. It's not, it's not as high a risk. It's not as increased a risk in a transplant population as some of the other ones we've talked about, like skin uh, and lymphoma, but um, it's twice as high, and it's just so easy to get a colonoscopy. Uh, that's relevant to um, patients over the age of 50, maybe younger, if they have a family history of uh, colon cancer. Um, and, um, you know, we can have stool check for blood, but really in today's day and age, colonoscopy is, uh, is the way to go, and um, that's not controversial. Why, why? It seems like the need for colonoscopy has gotten that extended at times. Yes. Uh, and why is that? Because yeah, these. You know, like uh, when I turned 50, no. my GI said, oh, be, for you, you better go every three years, and then yeah, that sounds good. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, yeah, you're good, come back in 10 years. Yeah. Um, there are uh, several reasons for it. Um, uh, the, um, the scopes and the proficiency of the endoscopist have gotten really good. So, um, you know, the optics didn't used to be as good, and uh, the way to preps are so good these days and the optics technology and, and all are so good that you're pretty darn sure when you have a competent endoscopist do a colonoscopy, get through the whole colon and come out, but there's nothing there when they're done. That's part of it. Uh, and, um, you know, there's a balance when the tasks, when the task forces recommend standards for this sort of thing because there's, a, there's an effort to balance the um, uh, improvement in health with the costs. So, you know, it's cheaper for society to have people getting scope once every three years than every year. I'm not advocating that we would get a colonoscopy every week, but um, I would say that with most of these things, there's a range, um, and as a transplant recipient, you ought to steer towards the more frequent part of that reasonable range. That would be my rule of thumb. Uh, liver cancer. Uh, so uh, we had a question about that before and um, transplant is very, very, very successful in treating many liver cancers, but it's important to have screening after the transplant as well because it can come back. Even though you take the liver out, the cells from the liver cancer might be circulating through the body of the recipient their immune system's good enough to kind of keep it at bay, but sometimes one of those liver cancer cells will get back into the new liver. And if we pick it up in an early enough uh, fashion, we can prolong life. So um, we've talked about kidneys, we've talked about the gynecology exam and uh, full physical colonoscopies, certainly people who uh, have any kind of prior smoking history uh, get their chest x-ray at uh, recommended intervals. And we're going to talk about skin cancer, uh, you know, screening a little bit later. And these are general guidelines, obviously, I, you know, you're, we have people here who have had different organs and a different history from different programs, and so I can't, I can't give you a piece of paper that says this is the hard and fast rule about what you ought to get every year. It's something you need to talk about with your team. But these are general guidelines. And um, again, I don't think it's so valuable to worry about cancers after transplant, but I would be pretty obsessive in keeping your appointments the longer you get out of transplant. 
maybe the more uh, comfortable we get, but it's really, uh, if there's an area to be you know, worried about, it's you know, a couple of months have gone by beyond when you're supposed to keep your appointment, we're all busy, you know, I don't always you know, follow up uh, for my uh, you know, health and well-being appointments without being tardy at times. This is an area where, especially a transplant population, ought to probably be a little obsessive and keep to, um, keep to the schedule. Now, what, what, what do we do when a patient has a little bit of a higher risk of cancer, maybe because of a prior cancer that they had, or maybe the donor did have a cancer, we take the organ, but you know, now we want to know how to decrease the chance of it becoming a problem. Or if a cancer is diagnosed, it may not be a terrible cancer, maybe we're getting you know, slow skin cancers, or maybe we have uh, you know, a kidney cancer, or a liver cancer came back, or um, so there are strategies to, uh, to deal with this that will often lead to cure. Uh, um, we want to minimize immunosuppression. If we're getting cancer or infection, it's not likely we're, gonna, we're a patient who we're worried about rejection. You can get both, but usually you know, everybody's immune system kind of has its comfort zone, and if we're getting more in the realm of infections and cancers, we want to back off on immunosuppression. We have a lot of rejection. We want to tank up on immunosuppression, and um, so um, the different um, immunosuppressive drugs each have their own risk of cancer, and um, I think that's a little too detailed to go into a, a talk tonight. Um, but your care team will know, you know, which. Uh, immunosuppressive strategies. We have so many choices of drugs and strategies to use. We didn't used to have that. That we can modify immunosuppressive regimens. Uh, and one of the things we'll consider is cancer risk. So I transplanted uh, a gentleman who had uh, uh, lymphoma a decade ago. Just uh, I did this just yesterday. And we didn't use the strong, potent cocktail of immunosuppressive drugs that we use uh, typically, we used a sort of a, a lighter regimen because we're not as worried about rejection. We don't want that lymphoma to come back. And that would be just you know one of any examples. So, if a cancer is diagnosed, for sure you need to have the transplant team involved in restructuring immunosuppressive regimens. Um, and I'm not giving a pharma talk, uh, if you will, but there is uh, really substantive um, evidence that what are called the um, target of rapamycin inhibitors. You may know of them as sirolimus or everolimus or rapamycin. Um, that is an immunosuppressive drug that uh, inhibits cell growth, division, and we talked about angiogenesis. So it actually has anti-cancer um, effect. It, it, it is immunosuppressing, but at the same time it also has an anti-cancer effect. The other immunosuppressive drugs don't tend to have that. Sometimes steroids for some cancers are, are part of the treatment regimen, but by and large, most of our immunosuppressive drugs increase the chance of cancer. But rapamycin, sirolimus, everolimus, one class of immunosuppressive drugs that um, are really worth thinking about in a patient when cancer is a concern. Now, you should not all go run out and ask your doctors to switch you to this because there are other you know, disadvantages, and there are, um, but in the face of concerns of cancer, this is something your doctors may talk to you about. And you may have cancers, and it's not the right drug for you, but it's certainly something that ought to be discussed. Um, antivirals, well, for some of the cancers, the mainstay of treatment is getting rid of the virus. A lot of the um, lymphomas, um, we have to reduce immunosuppression, but it's the antiviral medication, the, vi the, the drug that gets rid of the Epstein-Barr virus that we talked to, for instance, that leads to a cure of the cancer. So antivirals are, are a very important part of it. And then we talked about multidisciplinary cancer care, so that if chemotherapy or radiation are needed, surgery is needed, um, that's done in the context of being a transplant recipient. Um, not being an organ with cancer in it, but 
someone who care team and sees the whole big picture. Once in a while, we take the transplant out. Um, that's a you know a sad thing to have to do, but sometimes that's curative. Uh, in the case of um, you know, I, I don't want to talk about too many sad sorts of things because you're you know a group of transplant patients, but um, I. There's a situation, a very rare situation, when a donor malignancy is transmitted. We talked about that a little bit. Well, say it's a kidney. Um, if we stop immunosuppression, not only will we reject the organ, but we'll actually end up rejecting the cancer that was transplanted into us. And so um, sometimes we can get the immune system to help cure the cancer and then hopefully get another, for instance, kidney transplant later. And um, the um, Pat Risk Alliance, and this is something that I think TRIO is very uh, involved in, Jim, is that yes, correct? Um, yep. They've had some really neat slides on skin cancer and so I borrowed some of those because uh, um, I think skin cancer is a good one to go through uh, that really um, reiterates the importance of you know, screening, prevention, and uh, multidisciplinary care, you know, care from uh, a group of specialists that work well together, and then some of the treatments that we talked about. So we'll run through this on, um, on skin cancer, and most of these slides are available. If uh, anybody goes out to get that booklet, Tria's name is in the booklet, because Elizabeth Rubin, one of our chapter members, was the liaison to the at-risk partnership. Um, so, uh, so skin cancer in transplant recipients, the most common post-transplant cancer, 70%, up to 70% of high-risk long-term patients will develop it. Now, what's high-risk? High-risk are you know, Caucasians who live in um, very sun-laden areas, for instance, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, I don't think that too many in this room are from that high-risk population. But uh, heart transplant recipients have a, um, uh, got a three-fold higher risk of skin cancer. So, Why? we don't know that. Mm -hmm. you know, probably because of the heavy, probably somewhat related to the very heavy level of immunosuppression that heart recipients need. Um, <coughs> So there's a wide spectrum. Skin cancer is a big basket of different types of cancers, um, but uh, you know, in some patients, this is a minor problem. One or two little moles that have to get removed on occasion, not a big deal. Uh, for others, it means many doctors' visits, operations. There are uh, instances, uh, actually, where where we know of patients who have had over 100 skin cancers removed, and on rare instances skin cancer can actually lead to loss of life but the um, the worst case scenario is really rare in a transplant recipient but the more common scenario of having some skin cancers is common enough that you should pay attention and I know you do to this there are different types of skin cancers so you may have heard of squamous cell carcinoma that's the most common and it happens uh, approximately 65 times higher risk in a transplant recipient than in, a, in the general population. <coughs> Unfortunately, it is very rarely you know, something that spreads or, or leads to loss of life, but it can really impact one's life. Um, then there's basal cell carcinoma, that's about a tenfold increase. So squamous cell carcinoma, basal cell carcinoma, be a problem, it's more local, you know, local spread sometimes could be a little disfiguring. You need to have these things removed. Uh, they don't lead to loss of life. Melanoma is a terrible cancer. It's a skin cancer. That happens about twice as common in a transplant recipient as in the general population. So the real one that when we talk about transplant that's the front of our minds, fortunately, is the less dangerous, but still important, squamous cell carcinoma and basal cell carcinoma. And this is a little uh, 
depiction of how it happens, just to kind of for those of you who are uh, who have a scientific background, maybe just to reiterate some of the things we spoke about before uh, regarding immunosuppression and viruses. So in the case of skin cancer, it's the sun, of course, that is that is an added risk here. So the ultraviolet light uh, causes damage to the DNA in the skin cells, and um, it also decreases, it also directly decreases the immune function of immune cells in the skin. So it causes damage to some skin cells, and the immune cells in the skin are damaged by sun as well. And then, um, usually our uh, native immune system can handle that and lead to repair, but when we're on immunosuppressive drugs, we don't have as good a protective mechanism when this happens. Then you throw into that that the immunosuppression causes the uh, HPV virus, and the HPV virus, um, papillomavirus, in and of itself causes damage to skin DNA. So we have you know, the sun, the immunosuppressant drugs, the virus, uh, and we have a you know, perfect storm for developing skin cancers. And that's uh, similar to a lot of the other cancers, not the sun part of it, but the immunosuppression of the viruses that we, that we uh, discussed already. Uh, risk factors, so similar to the general population, the older we are, the more fair skin we are, the more time we spend in the sun, uh, are the are the big risk factors, but it's exponentially higher in the in the transplant population. And then there's some things that are specific to transplant patients. Patients who are transplanted at an older age need to be even more concerned about this. Uh, the longer one um, is from the time of transplant, because some of these DNA damaged things can take a decade or two until they present themselves. And so, um, you know, we're more worried about this in somebody who had their transplant 10 years ago than in somebody who had their transplant uh, two years ago. Patients who had a lot of bouts of rejection, and so they got a lot of different immunosuppressive drugs, are more prone to getting skin cancer. And uh, warts or this uh, papillomavirus increase the chance of skin cancer. That's why we have to get a good exam. Uh, so how do you prevent it? Well, definitely get the skin cancers taken care of before the transplant. So you know, dermatology you know, clearance is, is important for a transplant candidate. Uh, get educated like we're doing tonight. Uh, Self-exam is very important because this is something where you know, we're not looking for kidney cysts. We're just examining our skin. Uh, we'll have a slide on that. And um, I think that... Um, we talked about seeing, you know, get a colonoscopy and all. So a transplant recipient, in, in my opinion, really ought to see a dermatologist at least once a year. And um, recipients who are at even higher risk may need to see a dermatologist more frequently than that. But the um, average garden variety transplant recipient should, in my view, and um, many of the transplant professionals will agree with that, see a dermatologist once a year. Uh, and uh, this will allow early treatment before bigger problems happen. So over here, there's something we can really do. You know, it's a lot easier than having to get our polyps removed to avoid colon cancer. We can um, utilize sun protection, so limiting outdoor activities, uh, wearing protective clothing. If you can see through the clothing, it's not really protective. Long sleeve, long shirt, broad brim hats. Um, and then at least an SPF 30 sunscreen. Uh, putting it on once doesn't do any good if you're going swimming or perspiring and it comes off, you have to reapply it. This isn't something to just do on summer vacation. It really becomes part of daily uh, health and well-being. This is the way the uh, at-risk recommends um, the self-exam, and I thought it was also an excellent slide, and that's available online. And that really is something you can do once a month. So if you need to see the dermatologist before the annual visit when something pops up, it's just so easy. You know, if we find something, it's just very easy to take care of it when it's small and not deep. 
As you're doing self-exam, what do you look for? The same thing that we would look for in the general population is the ABCDEs. Um, asymmetry means moles that are not um, shaped smoothly around their outer border. Uh, variations in color, particularly red areas. Uh, the larger the size of the skin lesion, the more concerning. Most of these are obvious. Skin, uh, when there's a change in a, in a mole, you know, something's a little different about it. Maybe scaling or changing color or size. Uh, bleeds that didn't used to do that. Um, you may have scratched something or, or injured it, but the healing is taking too long. That should be a, an alarm to get that checked out. And multidisciplinary teams. So this is just one example. Many of your transplant centers have this. We're very proud of the uh, Dermatology Center for Transplant Center for, for patients at, at, at our program. Um, the idea being that dermatologists are busy, right? They see a lot of patients. And um, you know, a transplant patient is a little more complicated. Uh, you want to have a dermatologist who's interested and understands the nuances of, of transplant care. It's not that complicated, but um, uh, this is one example of, you know, amongst others of a group of dermatologists that have a whole focus on transplant patients. And so they, you know, they, they get to you for the appointments early, they're really careful when they do the exam, and if they find something, you know, maybe in a regular, not a regular, maybe in a non-transplant, non-immunosuppressed patient, they watch and wait a little bit more. Over here, they know it's a transplant patient. They'll biopsy sooner. Uh, and um, we'll talk about immunosuppressive options if they're worried about something with the transplant team. So uh, skin cancer isn't as complicated necessarily as you know, lymphoma or uh, some of the other solid organ uh, cancers that we can get. But even with skin cancer, uh, it's a high frequency event. This should be uh, ideally um, part of the larger transplant team, if you will. Uh, there was a question about liver cancer, so I have one or two slides on that. Um, so um, HCC is liver cancer. Sorry for the medical nomenclature. And um, cirrhosis is the biggest risk factor for liver cancer. Chemotherapy is not very effective for liver cancer. Um, it's difficult to cut out a liver cancer from a patient with cirrhosis or to do the other potential treatments because the cirrhosis makes it dangerous to operate on the liver or to do other um, treatments. Uh, ablation means burning and embolization means blocking the blood flow to tumors. So whether the treatment might be in the radiology department or in the operating room, uh, one is limited in what they can provide a patient because of the cirrhosis of the disease. So liver is a big organ, and um, if the cirrhosis makes a liver cancer in one part of the liver, there's a very good chance it's going to make a liver cancer in another part of that organ. And so liver cancer is um, not just one spot in the liver, it's a concern that there'll be other ones elsewhere in the liver. Um, and so transplant is really uh, the only cure in most cases of liver cancer in cirrhotics. Um, there are some alternatives if it's a small cancer in a patient whose cirrhosis is early, but by and large, cirrhosis in liver cancer often needs a transplant. Uh, and um, patients who have liver cancer uh, move up the list fairly expeditiously. Uh, because the idea is that you know, we want to provide them with a transplant before the cancer spreads. And so even if they don't have, um, even if they're not failing from liver failure from the complications of cirrhosis, they still get a priority because of the cancer per se. And so we have criteria because sometimes if there's too much cancer, then they don't do well with a transplant because the cat's out of the bag, if you will. But for many patients, this is really life-saving. Uh, and alters survival in a negative way only a drop. So most liver cancers that lead to a transplant, uh, in most cases that transplant is curative of the cancer. So it's, it's um, and uh, back in um, 
you know, we change the way livers get uh, dis allocated and distributed to people, and we wish we had enough livers to give everybody, but the rules, uh, when the rules became such that the cancer patients had a priority, the uh, floodgates opened because the results are so good and they don't have another option. Uh, you need a multidisciplinary care team when we're talking about transplant for liver cancer because the liver cancer patients still need to wait until they can get an organ, even though they have an allocation priority. In the Delaware Valley, for instance, depending on blood type and all, it's not uncommon to have to wait for more than a year. So you need a multidisciplinary care team of specialists who can do things to keep the liver cancer from spreading while a patient waits for their transplant. And um, uh, we're, you know, we're fairly liberal about what types of donors we offer patients with cancer because we don't want patients to wait for the perfect organ and lose their opportunity for transplant. We want them to do well after transplant, but sometimes they have to take a little bit of a risk with a donor um, in order to get the transplant, and almost all of them do well, not more than 90% do well after the transplant. And then there are things that we do to keep the cancer at bay uh, taste means blocking the blood flow to the tumor, and local regional therapy means doing things like uh, burning it. Um, these are not typically curative, but they're good at keeping the cancer at bay. So liver cancer uh, is an example of a cancer that we would do a transplant to cure, and of a um, cirrhotics have to get screened with ultrasounds and blood work so that if they develop cancer, it can be picked up early. Uh, and um, if it's diagnosed and a transplant is needed, there are things that can be done to keep the tumor from growing while a patient waits for the transplant. And then after the transplant, patients who had a transplant for liver cancer have to be followed because on occasion the cancer will come back and if it's picked up early, it can be um, uh, treated. And how would it be treated? Well, it depends where it is. If it's in the liver, because the, can the, the liver cancer cells have a, have a tendency to want to live in the liver. Uh, and so then we can you know, cut it out or um, do the same treatments we would do before, uh, burn it, block the blood flow to it. If it presents outside of the liver, uh, we can uh, do a resection. And then there is a chemotherapy drug uh, that in the transplant situation is um, sometimes helpful. Uh, it's called serafinib. And, um, so I think uh, I'm getting towards the end of my slides, but um, uh, I guess I guess a real theme. I mean, I was if there was a message I wanted to kind of share. Um, uh, you know, we're talking about cancer after transplant, but I think the real theme is it's uh, like a lot of other areas that. Uh, affect a transplant recipient. Um, I think focus on the different, you know, parts. Uh, not just not just the. Um, I don't mean to be punny. I mean, but not just the, the organ part, but the, you know, health and well-being and um, the rest of life is uh, something that will lead to fewer problems with cancer. And um, it is important to be good patients and to uh, you know keep appointments, follow up. Uh, and um, uh, so I hope this is helpful. I, I, most of what I've learned is from a great group of colleagues that I work with, and um, it's been good to talk to you. But maybe I have some more questions I can try to answer. You mentioned antivirals on uh, yes. one of your slides. Do they work the same way as um, <clears throat> like penicillin works with bacteria? Do does do the viruses get resistant to to antiviral medicine as well? Uh, yeah, very similar. Yeah. Uh, viruses um, are different than bacteria, but um, we have, um, you know, depending on which virus we were talking about, we have good antivirals. There are instances of resistance, uh, but um, for the most part, uh, there are not too many cases where we can't cure the virus. Sure. The perfusion process that they use for uh, kidney today. Yes, I heard they were going to. They were trying to use that also for livers. Is that, That's right. Is that uh, been successful, or where does that stand? Uh, right now, the uh, 
the um, I think you're referring to the normal thermic or subnormal thermic perfusion of organs, um, and um, there there is a uh, liver trial that um, has been um, very promising in the United Kingdom uh, and in Europe, and uh, that uh, a, car, a, a parallel trial is um, soon to start in the United States, but. Um, the results are very early, but it's, it's uh, looks very promising. The idea there being that now <coughs> livers could travel further. Like well, it'd be like beneficial in many ways. It would allow livers to travel further. It would allow um, livers that have some damage from the donor to heal a little bit before they are transplanted. It would allow there to be more interest in taking a risk with a liver because there'd be a chance to um, study that liver while it's on the machine before rushing to transplant it and trying to see if we can gain uh, confidence that it would be a good organ. Also, I call on that for kidneys. I heard in Europe they're actually taking kidneys from people that are perhaps dead in an accident scene and be able to recover those kidneys. Is there anything being done here along those lines of projects? Yeah, those are basis? called un uncontrolled um, donation after cardiac death donors. And um, I, most organs, face a great deal of damage. But the kidney is very resilient. Um, it's not something that's really being done in the United States. Uh, you know, we have, the American population is very um, focused, uh, you know, appropriately on consent and uh, uh, disclosure and um, the countries that do this, like Spain, is very advanced in what you're talking about. Uh, they, you know, they scoop a dead patient up, rush them into the hospital, and put them on the heart bypass machine and all, and they have uh, four hours or so to get consent from the family to then take the organs for transplant. But they have presumed consent for organ donation in Spain. I was thinking more of the lines where people are already donors when that occurs. When they so the process that the organ bank has to go through when you know, to confirm that someone really is a donor, and even if they are a donor, to um, plan with the donor's uh, loved ones is fairly rigorous. It can be expeditious, but it's still rigorous. And in a case where um, the donor is has no, you know, um, blood pressure, no heart rate, their uh, the, the time crunch is so severe that it's been a challenge in the U.S. to be able to use those donors. I don't know that it'll always be a challenge, but um, it is now. <laughs> it is now, and you know the uh, society changes, and and the different uh, uh, you know the different paradigms of informed consent and disclosure and all change as society changes. There's a great deal of work um, on the part of the uh, certainly on the part of UNOS and on the part of the professional transplant societies to look at ways to increase organ donation. And um, the, the one that you mentioned is, um, you know, is one that's under discussion. I think, I think it'll happen. That's my view. I mean, some are opposed to it. So not because they're opposed to more donors, but they just don't want a situation where the public would lose trust because Proponents of organ donation um, take someone and take organs out and all before family has a chance to process all of that. The 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 work that is being done in the UK with the uh, liver perfusion, like, the, but the results of that's extending the life of that liver for hours, correct? Not not days. I mean, to, to, you, you mentioned they could do a little additional testing. And, and even do things to enhance the quality of the liver? Yes. I mean, how much time are they talking about extending? Well, uh, they had a patient in the UK that had a liver on a pump for 24 hours, which is a very long time. Uh, they, this happens to be, in, I, um, I didn't put the gentleman up to it, but it happens to be an area of great interest to me. Uh, we're in some discussion with the organ bank about doing a trial like that here. Um, so I know the, um, investigators there you know very well and it's exciting I mean if you take liver as an example fatty livers don't preserve well so many donors have a fatty liver you know today with the 
know, with the problems and challenges of, of you know, keeping our weights uh, under control. But fatty livers don't preserve well. Remarkably, if you put a liver on that machine within 24 hours, many of those livers uh, have dissipation of the fat. So really? there's 24 hours can, for a reparative process can be a long time depending on the particular organ. And in lungs, uh, it's been you know, a game changer. Uh, so it doesn't seem like a long time, but it probably will be transformative, I think. Uh, I'm surprised to hear a group of transplant recipients so knowledgeable about it. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I thought you would know a lot. I think you probably do know a lot about it. cancer and transplant. I don't know if I'll tell you anything, but uh, the uh, perfusion thing is, uh, uh, it's of interest to me that you know so much about that. That's great. You've got a crew in here that are probably the cream of the crop as far as being aware, especially like people like Tom out there talking. So you're tuned into these things because your audience has asked about them. That's right. And so this is probably not your typical no. patient population. Uh, most of them go off and just live their life as they can. A number of us just get so involved with it that you do pick up on these things. And but uh, the transplant recipients and donor families and donors and all are the best ambassadors for transplant initiatives, uh, advocacy issues, and our patient support groups that we run. I mean, I can spend you know five, six, seven, eight appointments with a transplant candidate and until we get them into the transplant support group. Um, I don't. They don't want to know what I have to say. So um, this is, you know, it's, it's great that you're. Uh, Google makes it a lot easier. Yeah. <laughs> so you had mentioned earlier about pancreases with uh, cancer that they're not um, replacing pancreases that have cancer or tumors, um, or just doesn't happen. It's very rare. So the the. Most common pancreas cancer, and the one that most people focus on, uh, called adenocarcinoma of the pancreas, is a is a is a terrible cancer. Um, and uh, someone who's had that just won't fare well on immunosuppression. We certainly wouldn't want an organ from somebody who had that. There are rarer uh, pancreas uh, tumors that are called uh, neoendocrine tumors, and. Um, Patients can have removal of their pancreas for for those types of tumors, and they could go on to receive a pancreas transplant. Uh, that's a rare situation, but I just had a, I do school talks, and uh, this past year it was the first time someone told me that their pancreas was replaced because they had a cancerous tumor. It was probably one of these neoendocrine tumors. Okay. Steve Jobs had a liver transplant and all, and he had that type of a pancreas okay. cancer. Mm -hmm. Of course. You know, the, uh, when the word got out, there's so many, unfortunately, uh, a lot of patients get the garden variety pancreas cancer. They're not transplant candidates, and they all started showing up at transplant programs, and we couldn't offer them much. Well, most of the time, pancreatic cancer, until it's, by the time you have symptoms, it's already spreading. That's right. So, if I understand, in summary, what you've said, except for cancers coming with the donation, <laughs> if, for example, a liver recipient, and that's the only organ I know of where they get off of drugs sometimes, rare, but it happens. if they were able to get off the medications, would they have normal risk of cancers? Or are there other factors that play into that? And I'm just trying to summarize what you've said. I see if I got it all. Um, so, uh, yeah, Jim is very kind. So you, you <coughs> raised the thing that I forgot to say. But, um, <laughs> didn't mean to do uh, that. That was a nice way of telling me that. So, <laughs> no, I didn't know that. One of the, uh, you know, the holy grail of transplant, or if you will, is to is to be able to stop immunosuppression after a transplant and have tolerance. And there are a lot of research going into uh, uh, how we would uh, have a recipient develop tolerance so we could stop immunosuppression uh, and figure out, you know, at least in whom it would be safe to do that. And if we did that, one of the benefits would be a decrease in this issue of post-transplant cancer. That's right. It would become normal in that sense. Okay. Yeah, because we wouldn't have the problem right. of the immunosuppression or of the uh, virus. My point is everything traces back, basically, except for the donated organ, to the immunosuppression drugs. That's the big, uh, that's the big kicker here, yes. Yeah. Okay. How do you know for livers? 
Um, I, know, I know a girl, uh, she's in uh, 12th grade now. She got her transplant when she was a year old. And she said she always took the lowest level. And when she turned 15, they stopped giving her the suppressant. So she's been off for like two years. I was wondering, how do you know? Like, yeah, so is please, it, is first don't kind of be tolerant. Please do not. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> saying, um, not what I'm saying. Um, yeah, so interestingly, um, patients who receive a transplant as infants or young children become very tolerant of the organ. So they're the most likely, unless they're transplanted for an autoimmune disease, they're the most likely to be able to come off immunosuppression. Uh, but um, we don't have a good way of knowing who can and who can't come off immunosuppression. And so, you know, with so many drugs available today, it's possible to um, maintain a low level of immunosuppression, not have rejection and not increase the risk of cancer, but too much. The other ones I've heard about more commonly were the livers. Livers where they take them all. Yeah, Liver we have, we have be, a friend uh, that also uh, most he, had, he had hepatitis C. Yeah. When he found there was a special medication for the hepatitis C, mm -hmm. when he would now was, when it showed negative, free of hepatitis, he was also, they also took him off immunosuppressant. It. it seemed like that medication had something to do with uh, being able to go for that. Do you know anything about that or how does that? I'm not sure I understand. The, the, um, I mean, now we have really good cures over the past you know, two years for hepatitis C. Um, Hepatitis C is, does reduce our immunity. So sometimes patients who cure the hepatitis C can actually have a little bit of a higher risk for rejection. Um, but um, that's uh, not, not common. Now, do you expect with the drug that's been uh, developed to cure hepatitis C, the number of people waiting for a liver transplant to decrease over time? I don't think so. Uh, I think the number of patients with hepatitis C waiting for a transplant will diminish. But uh, until we you know, address some of the other problems that are increasing, um, you know, the diabetes and high cholesterol and um, you know, uh, patients who suffer from you know, weight gain and all, we're going to have a lot of patients who need uh, transplants because the diabetes and uh, obesity are leading to um, a skyrocket in the need of transplant. Anybody else have any questions before we close? Susan, would you do the honors? David, that was excellent. I well, really appreciate how you were. Gave a chance to review the topic and read a lot of articles on it. Also, <laughs> thanks for the opportunity. Well, it, you you used language that we could understand yes. and use a lot of good examples that made it very easy for a patient to understand what you were talking about from the degree I know you practice this. And I gotta say, I've worked with David, as I said, uh, with UNOS and Pan's Gun History. That's how I first got to meet him. And he's been amazingly uh, available when we had questions or sit down with him. And secondly, I can tell you on a very personal basis, traveling with him from UNOS meetings where you really get to sit down and another surgeon, uh, Lloyd, I'm thinking of over New York, for example, and just see the human element behind what we take for granted almost. And so you've got you know a two-day long-term meeting, coming home, plane delayed, getting tired and saying, I gotta get back to the, and honestly saying, I gotta get back to the office when we leave here, and I've got early surgery tomorrow morning, and I'm thinking, oh, all I gotta do is go home to bed. <laughs> So, it, truly, David, we recognize you as a very dedicated person to the transplant environment, and we as patients really appreciate you taking your time tonight. Come on, join us. Susan? Yeah, and we want to give you a token. Oh, you don't have uh, to do that. No, we, we do. <laughs> oh, that's great. Oh, thanks so much. Well, happy holidays and best of luck for all of you. Thank you.